We're now starting chapter 13, which is entitled Trading Environmental Permits. The policy of using environmental permits to control pollution is also known as cap and trade. That was not the case when your book is written. Uh, the term cap and trade is a more recent term. The procedure is as follows. The government first determines the optimal pollution level. So Q star or an optimal level of, of abatement. Then it so so this isn't the, this next step is not particularly important. I said I write determine permit size, for example, one ton, and number of permits, for example, one hundred. So let's say you that that the Q star was equivalent to an optimal pollution level of a hundred tons. If if you wanted to make 100 permits, then the permit size would be one ton. If you wanted to make 200 permits, then the permit size would be half a ton. So uh, there's a um, all you need is that the permit size, for example, one ton, times the number of permits, for example, 100, equal the number of, of tons of pollution that's socially optimal. So if you increase the number of permits, you proportionally decrease the permit size and the product of those two stays exactly the same. So that's why I say this is a more of a, a detail. Typically you can only trade one permit. By trade what we mean is that a firm that wants to pollute more than the number of permits that it currently has in hand would purchase from another firm or perhaps from the government but here we're just going to talk about another firm additional permits. The the permit size, for example, one ton, therefore it represents the, it's kind of like one penny in currency, it represents the minimum amount of, of the object that can be traded. And so if the permit size were particularly large, it might hinder trade because people could only buy and sell in big chunks. Much more consequential than then the second step here is the is the third. How are the permits initially allocated? And there are two ways of doing it. The most straightforward is allocating by auctions. So the system is going to work like this. The government announces that as of a particular date, in order to pollute, you're going to have to have a permit. And f let's take this example of each permit permits one ton of pollution. So the government's going to start measuring how much pollution you emit. Usually this is one particular type of pollutant. And as long as the pollution you emit over, let's say, one year is less than one ton, then you're good. But if it's not, then it's illegal, or you'd have to buy more permits from someplace, get more permits from someplace, in order to in, in order to cover the amount of pollution that you actually did. So every polluter needs permits. The auction method of initial distribution says that the government has printed out, let's say, 100 permits and puts them up for auction. And the firms bid on it, and uh, it's, it's a little bit more complicated than the, that's the standard auctions that you see in movies and TV shows because we're not you're not auctioning off one object you're auctioning off for example a hundred objects a hundred permits or you know maybe 10,000 permits so it's a little bit more complicated but the basic idea is that um, a uh, a price is set at which the government can sell all these permits economists are familiar with this kind of auction because this is the way that the U.S. Treasury auctions off U.S. Treasury bonds. It runs, uh, this is the way it, the U.S. Treasury sells uh, U.S. Treasury bonds. It runs auctions and of course these auctions just like the tradable permit auctions are not just for one object, they're for a whole bunch of objects. Let's say, you know, I don't know, uh, 200 million dollars of 10-year treasury bonds. 
and the what the treasury does is it collects bids on these auctions and then sets the lowest price that uh, enables it to um, uh, to to, to, to sell the to sell sell the bonds. Well, I said lowest price. Um, it set it sets a price that enables it th that's sufficiently low that people are willing to buy the bonds that the treasury wants to sell, but there's no excess demand. People don't want to buy uh, more than that. I, I believe that's I believe that's the way the the price is set. Another way is called grandfathering. This is a rather strange name. I'll explain the name in a minute, but first let me explain what grandfathering is. Grandfathering is the government deciding to give pollution permits away for free, proportional to how much pollution the firms emitted. There is, however, the following problem. It takes a while to pass laws and regulations. Suppose that, that the newspapers reported that Congress was considering instituting a tradable permit scheme for, let's say, carbon dioxide, a greenhouse gas, and that it was going to be based on the amount of pollution that firms emitted this year. The more pollution firms emitted this year, the more permits they were going to get for free if this bill got passed and signed into law. The problem is that then firms would immediately have an incentive to start trying to pollute as much as they could this year because the permits they would get after the law was passed, if the law was passed, then the permits that they would get would be proportional to how much pollution they emitted this year. Clearly, you don't want to do that. You don't want to incentivize, incentivize polluters to try to pollute as much as possible, to increase their pollution as much as possible, in order to be able to get more permits once the system comes into effect. Therefore, what you do is you set the grandfather criteria based on the pollution in some past year. For example, the firms are going to get in the future pollution permits for free based on how much pollution they emitted two years ago. That way you don't have any incentive to increase pollution because the uh, because it's based on something that happened in the past rather than something that's happening now and in the future. So these are the two main ways of allocating permits. Let me now explain the, the word grandfathering because it seems to be such a strange word. The basic idea is that we're going to do something not based on how much you're polluting now, but based on how much you're polluting in the past. So let's see if I can pull up, let me um, try it, let me if I can pull up Wikipedia. Okay, so here's Wikipedia's explanation of grandfather clause. And uh, as it describes uh, he here, I'm not going to read the whole thing, This, but it comes from American history. When Southern states in the late 19th century were trying to figure out how to disenfranchise African-American voters. So right after the Civil War, the Northern armies were remained in the Southern states and enforced the, the amendments that were passed after the Civil War to expand the right to vote to African-Americans. And so there was a period between 1865 and the mid-1870s where African Americans could vote just as easily as as other people could in the southern states and the southern states had uh, biracial uh, governments with uh, African Americans elected even to the governorship in at least Louisiana. But, um, but after the, the early 1870s, the federal troops were withdrawn from the South, and white racists tried to figure out how to disenfranchise African American voters. But one of the newer amendments to the Constitution said that one couldn't discriminate on the basis of race. So what they managed to figure out how to do is to discriminate in the following method. They they impose here literacy tests, uh, poll taxes, 
other hindrances to voting, but exempted uh, people, now women couldn't vote in these states, so there was only men, exempted men whose ancestors, whose grandfathers, had the right to vote before the Civil War. Now, so the, um, these literacy tests and poll taxes were very onerous, and they were interpreted in unfair ways. So, for example, you had to read and interpret a, a section of a state constitution, and the Registrar of Voters, who was a political officer, judged whether you did a good job or a bad job, and if they wanted to discriminate against you, they could just say that you did a bad job. And the poll taxes could be uh, fairly high and unaffordable for poor people. But because of this grandfather clause, um, poor or illiterate white people could still vote because their grandfathers could vote. So that's the idea of j j um, basing a regulation, putting the regulation on the basis of something that happened a long time in the past. So that's the history of the term grandfather clause. Uh, by the way, uh, Wikipedia says that these these uh, laws were found unconstitutional by the United States Supreme Court in 1915. But by that time, the southern states pretty quickly figured out other ways of disenfranchising African Americans. Uh, one way is certainly just through the implicit threat of violence if they tried to vote. Back to pollution permits. A modern example of this policy debate about whether the initial allocation of permits should be through auctions or through grandfathering was the proposal against climate change proposed by Barack Obama when he was running for president in 2008. Just as some background, back in 2008, concern about global climate change was bipartisan. Now there were certainly people in actually both political parties who came from states that had strong fossil fuel industries and weren't interested in combating climate change. But there were other people from both US political parties, both Democrats and Republicans, who were concerned about climate change. John McCain, who was Barack Obama's opponent in the 2008 presidential election, was a senator from Arizona who had introduced bipartisan legislation to combat climate change. So at that time, unlike nowadays, it was a, an issue of bipartisan concern. Oh, sorry, that's my, that's my dog. Sorry for that interruption. That was my dog barking. Barack Obama first proposed that he proposed a cap-and-trade system for controlling climate change. And he first proposed that most of the permits were distributed, should be distributed by auctions. Clearly, firms like grandfathering a lot more than auctions, because when there's grandfathering, then the firms get permits for free, whereas when there are auctions, the firms have to pay for the permits. So there was opposition to this plan. And as the election got closer and closer, Obama changed his plan to, actually more than once, each time to propose that more of the permits would be distributed by grandfathering and fewer, the, fewer of the permits would be distributed by auctions. Now, of course, as it turned out, uh, no, climate, no federal climate change policy was ever enacted by the US Congress during Obama's um, presidential term. But that was just an example of auctions and grandfathering and that one one can one it's not necessarily an either or situation you could distribute let's say half the permits by auctions and the other half by grandfathering the final design question is whether permits expire it's probably simplest to have permits not expire to have them be permanent but you could have permits expire let's say every after five years or after one year and then the government would then either hold new auctions or engage in new grandfathering in order to distribute the new permits. Um, let's see.
see. I think that's all I want to say in this video. Oh, one more thing about permanent exploration. If the government is, if the government wants permits to expire, so that in the future, when it issues fresh permits, it might issue fewer fresh permits. So, in other words, decrease pollution, decrease the permitted pollution. Another way to do that, in if you had permanent permits, permits that never expired, is for the government to go into the the permit market and buy permits and then retire them. And, and that that raises a a point I should make that it is possible for people who aren't polluters to buy pollution permits and then not use them. So, for example, an environmental organization um, could under usual setup I mean the laws could make something like this illegal but but usually an environmental organization could buy some permits and then just not pollute and that would be a way of decreasing the total number the total amount of pollution so what we're going to do next in the next video is an extended example based on box 13.1 which is entitled how tradable permits work and just to give you a, a, an introduction to what, what we're going to be saying there, you're going to have two polluting firms, A and B. They're going to have different pollution costs. We're going to assume that the initial allocation of permits has been done, so they, they both have permits. And the question is, since, they're, since these permits are tradable, that means that you can buy and sell them on the open market. And we're going to analyze whether the permits uh, would be bought and sold and under what conditions. So that's what's coming up.